Hello and welcome to the continuation of our assessments information. So this is chapter 12 of the NASM CPT uh, study information. Last class or last lecture was based on chapter 11, which was more of what we would call your health, wellness, and fitness assessments. This is going to move us into our postural, our movement, and our performance basis, so more dynamic um, types of um you know, assessment basis here, but understand too that I say dynamic because majority of these are movement, understand that some of them might be static based. So let's get into that, explain why that's the case and what we are going to do with that. So there are a lot of really good pictures that we're going to be able to see a lot of good diagrams in here. So pay attention to the locations, pay attention to the verbiage that's on the side of those, because those are always going to be really good to stop, pause, and basically have this really good set of you know notes that you could take based on that so again we we did health wellness and fitness so we got baseline information we got really good like demographic information that's going to tell us about that person well now we want to be able to assess like truly assess the body well the first thing we want to work on like it says here is posture assessment so static and dynamic static meaning motionless dynamic meaning with motion all right. So with this, with these postural assessments, we are going to just basically see what the body is going to do un, under specific non-loaded environments. How the body is shaped. Is there any imbalances? Are there any specific limitations? Are there any other factors that can be associated with that? So also with that, what we're going to do is we're going to do some movement assessments that are going to take us through how we can see any differences in movement impairments. So like if you're doing a push or a pull um, assessment, we can definitely see what's going on and how the optimal motion should be versus what you might see being non-optimal or impaired. And then lastly, we're gonna go through the performance assessments that we have that are gonna assess strength and muscular endurance, power, and then agility. And those are, again, those aren't dictated just, you know, and dedicated just to athletes. So whenever you see those words, understand that it could be for anybody, but it's got to be for the right instance. All right. So again, this is something that we've hit on before in terms of muscular imbalances. So we have to make sure that we're working through our over and under active. Um, overactive meaning that you're compensating on one side, that one side is constantly shortened, while the other is underactive is that there is no sort of um, you know impulse to that you know well I don't want to say that that's the wrong way to say it but there's you know less influence of the muscle at that point if it's underactive because it's not as strong and it's being influenced by the overactivity of another muscle group. All right, so that's you know getting into that back into that length ten, length tension relationship or muscles basically being at rest and how that would work. So with static posture, we want to make sure that we're again visually observing, looking at somebody from the specific standpoints of anterior frontal position, like frontal view, side view, lateral, posterior back view. Because even though the front and the side may look good, the back may not. Or if the back and the side look good, the front might not. Or the, the side might not, but the front and back do. So there's always those ways to work around it. But always understand, and I'll highlight right here, foot, ankle, knees, lumbo, pelvic, hip complex, shoulders, and head are our go-tos. Those are our specific locations that we want to pay attention to. The foot and ankle, the knee, the lumbo pelvic hip complex, the hip complex, you know, from the side view that is going to be, you know, basically where the ball of the femur runs into. From the front, it's that midsection. All right. And then the shoulders and then the head, all of those have specific alignments that we're going to be looking for, especially during, like I said, that static posture where you're not moving. So again, I'll blow this up a little bit bigger just so you can kind of see it a little bit clearer. But here is, a, there's again, those five checkpoints. There's your foot and ankle, your knee, your lumbo pelvic hip complex, your shoulders and thoracic spine, and your head and cervical spine. So all of those locations, and if you see, it's going to form that grid. From this, this is now from the anterior view. What we're looking for is, you know, are the shoulders having a nice squared appearance to them? Is the hip complex nice and straight across? Does the line from the, the basically the iliac crest of the hip, the top part of the hip, 
go straight down through the knee and then directly through the ankle? Or is there some, some sort of sway or some other impairment that we see or imbalance that we see? Does the head basically run straight down in the middle of the head? Does it run straight down through when I, you know, not being graphic, but through your midsection, your crotch area? So this is where we are looking for those pinpoint locations. Now, you are very much welcome to do this with the naked eye, okay? You're definitely able to look and observe this in a moment. My suggestion is always to err on the side of caution because you always want to have frame of reference is, you know, ask if your um, clients are willing to do pictures, all right? And those pictures will obviously be left in confidence that you're not going to do anything with them and that you are going to use them for the sole purpose that you want to see where imbalances are. Um, so that definitely helps because you can see all angles at that point. Now, again, there, you know, the anterior view also, you know, straight and parallel for the feet. So we're looking at those aspects as well. All right. Because we want those imaginary lines to be where they're shown from a lateral view. There we go. Again, the one thing we want to pay attention to is the ear. Okay. From the head down, we want to see that line start right pretty close, really kind of more that temporal position, but right through the ear basically down through the midpoint of your shoulder, running down through just slightly behind that midpoint of the hip, definitely behind the knee, and then directly through the ankle. And that line of sight is what we want to see for optimal positioning. All right. Now we can start seeing, especially in this midsection here, the, the LPHC, if we have somebody who has like an anteriorly, anteriorly tilted hip, what will happen is they might start having a little bit more of that rounded lower back. And then you'll start to see this midsection line right in the middle here. That would be more angled more toward the anterior downward position, like you're going to dump out a pail of water. All right. So depending upon where individuals are in their, you know, their posture, you might have a forward head. Well, a forward head is going to put your shoulders out of alignment. It's going to put your hips and knees and ankles out of alignment. So we're always looking again for these locations. This is where, again, a side view picture, and we could basically take a, a, a Sharpie if we were to, or, or even on a paint app, you know, we can take and run a line directly through and see, um, you know, where these lines of sight are. Right, very, very critical to understand that. And then from a posterior view, again, are our, uh, our, our five key points that we're looking for. But if you look, there's a couple additional lines here. And that's basically saying, are the scapula in alignment at that point? You know, are they running about the same? Now, right and left side imbalance can occur. We know that. We know that from side to side, we might have a little bit of a difference. But, you know, understand that this is part of that process of finding out those limitations. Okay. So we're looking for those pinpoints again, the hip, the shoulder, the head, the knees and the ankle, but this is from the back side as well. Okay. Also with the feet, you're looking for, you know, especially from the back view, look at their shoes or look at their feet and see if you're starting to see maybe the heel is in a different position. If their toes are starting to swing out, um, you might see their arches being a little bit, um, off and positioning. So these are all things we want to pay attention to at these levels. So what we're, what we want to know though, is if anything is out of alignment, all right, if there seems to be some sort of an imbalance somewhere, or if we looked at the, going back to some of the terminology, if there are any impairments that we're seeing, you know, with that posture, well, what are they? Well, pes plantis, lower cross and upper cross syndrome. All right. So if anything, make sure that you know these three cat, you know, characteristics, of, you know, for the three distortion patterns, because this might be something that pops up on your test that might say, you know, what distortion pattern is characterized by um, forward head and protracted round or rounded shoulders, you'd say upper cross. OK, so let's get into the three of them. First one is Pez plantis. If you look all right, at the ankle joint, you can see that you have what we call a collapsed arch. Okay, that collapsed arch is causing you to have what we would call eversion or the sole of the foot start to flare out. 
all right? The knee joint, you can see if you look at the line of sight of the femur and of the tib fib, you'll see that you're a little bit more bow-legged, which we call knee valgus, all right? And there's a little bit of what we would call internal rotation, meaning that the, the femur is rotating in. At the hip joint, you can see here we're adducted, we're pushing our knees together, so we're going toward the midline and internally rotated as well. Now, going through, you can see the potential muscle imbalances. Pay attention to the over and under active muscles here, as in overactive would be the gastric nemius and the soleus, so the calves are overactive, the adductors are overactive, pulling those knees in, and the hip flexors as well, which will cause internal rotation. Underactive, meaning that they need to be strengthened at some point. Overactive would need to be stretched. Underactive are the anterior and posterior tibialis, so the, right in the front part of your shin here. <clears throat> and the glute maximus and medius are not causing the femur to kick back and be externally rotated. With lower cross, that lower cross, think about it from the perspective of positioning. Lower cross means lower back. So what we're looking at here from the hip joint is what we would say is it's flexed. You can see here that by flex, meaning that we're pulling basically almost like the torso downward and you know causing this little bit of a shift in angle from upper to lower body. The pelvis is anteriorly tilted. You can drastically see that this person has, you know, they almost have like a shifted butt, meaning that their, their butt is, looks like it's raised and, it's, and you start to see that angle down. And then of course your lumbar si spine has that shift of really drastic, really, really drastic um, concave type of, you know, basically bending in motion. So your overactives here, your hip flexors, because the front is pulling so heavy, and then your lumbar extensors of your low back are, are very aggressive at that point as well. What are underactive are your glutes, your glute max and medius, your hamstrings, and your abdomen. And they're not strong enough to hold you back into that position. So it's basically allowing you to fall forward. All right, so that's lower cross syndrome. Then upper cross syndrome, now this is extremely exaggerated, but you get the idea. Upper cross is upper back, lower cross is lower back. Upper cross, you have that little bit more of that hunchback shape with a forward head position posture. So what we have, like we said here, the thoracic spine or that mid spine, T1 to 12, is what we would call excessive kyphosis or hunchback, where that positioning is flexed, okay? The shoulders are protracted. They're a little bit more like rotated forward, okay? Rounded forward, not rotated, excuse me. And there's some internal rotation or like a turning in. And then the head and the neck is jutted forward. It's not that you are in extension or flexion, it's just the cervical spine moves in that way. So what are your overactives in this case? Well, your pecs. Your pecs are gonna pull those shoulders forward. The levator scapula and the sternocleidomastoid, which are in the front portion of your neck, are pulling, you, pulling that neck forward. And your upper traps, again, are the upper traps are gonna pull forward. That's what's gonna cause this rounded, shoulder, this rounded upper back. Things that are underactive, your mid and lower traps down in the lower region. And then your rhomboids, and they, they are basically weak, so they're not able to pull that back into posture. And then your deep cervical flexors that are deep within the muscle that are gonna flex the neck, that are, you know, those are gonna be weak too, so it basically allows for everything to flop forward, okay? So you have no neck control at that point, and that's why the head wants to do what it wants to do. So all of those are characterized by where the location is. Pes plantis is in the, you know, that's not as easy to remember, but understand that that pes plantis is all about the feet and the, the feet and the legs, whereas lower cross is lower back and upper cross is, or, or upper back, excuse me, upper cross is upper back. All right, so those are what we would look for first. These are static positions, meaning that you are gonna have a person stand in front of you and you're gonna be looking for these types of environment. Now, some of them are exaggerated, but there are conditions that are a little bit, you know, again, this is why pictures really can do a service. And um, one of the other things you wanna make sure too, pro appropriate clothing for this is really gonna make a difference. So. Um, the tighter that the tighter the fit of the clothing, the better you can see these shapes of the person's posture. So 
you know, unfortunately, like for a guy, having a guy wear solely a pair of shorts would help greatly to see everything. Now, again, it's based on comfort, but it would definitely help. Females, a sports bra, a sports bra, halter top, tank top, and then shorts also make a huge difference so that you can see these locations. And the, the more drapier they are, the harder it is to see the outline of the body so that it's harder to see where the dysfunction lies. So we observed static, we wanna move into movement now. Now these are dynamic posture. This isn't about strength or push-pull. This is more about, we're gonna put your body through some motion. Well, actually push-pull would be part of this, but it's we're gonna get into just body motion first before we introduce equipment is more like what we wanna say, all right? So the, the movements that we're gonna do um, include some balancing, some squatting, some pushing and some pulling, and it's gonna go overhead squat, single leg squat, a pushing exercise, and then a pulling exercise in that order. Overhead squat, single leg squat, pushing assessment, pulling assessment. And we wanna see, again, those five kinetic chain points and from anterior, posterior, and lateral, lateral views. So your overhead squat, there's the starting position here. If you notice, the palms are facing forward, person is extended completely, all right? And then we're gonna move them through. So. Um, pay attention to your starting points, you know, foot and ankle complex is neutral. We don't want to have toes flared in or toes flared out. Um, you know, we want to be able to have our arms completely overhead, our elbows. This is where it gets tricky. Some people can't get to this position, but we want to be elbows fully extended at, to that person's limitations. Now myself, I can't, mine look like they're not fully extended but it's just my posture or my the way that my structure of my arms are it looks like i have a slight little bend but i don't it's fully extended so you have to be very clear to say okay extend your elbows you know do not lock them unless you're having you know only or if you do lock them only lock them to a very light position all right so that we can get to that overhead in the, pro the proper way now it says here, shoes off are preferable. And I agree with that. I mean, shoes and socks would be great, but if you can get at least the shoes off and have socks only, that's what we wanna do because we wanna see what the feet do when we go into that squatting motion. Okay, so again, squatting, what is the main thing here? I mean, obviously this is the anterior view. This is the, the lateral view. You can do a posterior view if you'd like. Um, but for now, what we're seeing here is that we want to make sure that the femur is parallel to the ground. That's the key point. That's going to be something that you probably will be asked on on a test. Okay. Uh, but again, squat depth, depending upon who the person is, can be reduced based on their, you know, their ability level and if maybe they've had a pre-existing injury or anything like that. Okay. So what you're going to have them do, five reps. Five reps. And the first rep might look really good. The fifth rep might look a little bit more um, not so good. And that's because the body is adjusting and letting itself kind of, you know, you're, you're relaxing a little bit more in the positioning. And so that when you relax more, surprisingly enough, the muscles that are imbalanced, if they are, are gonna move and move you. And so when you have the final ending position and you're watching this person go through that final ending range of motion, you're gonna see on that fifth rep where that person really is and what they're really doing. Instead of the first couple reps, they're really trying to make sure they're doing the reps right. So this is, you know, again, your anterior view, looking for some, some negatives here. Uh, feet turning out slightly, that would indicate external rotation. The knees caving in, that, you know, could be another one, knee valgus, okay. Um, feet turning out, that, that could also mean that you might start getting some varus or the knees coming out, but for right now, we're looking at the toes. Toes and knees for this one here. And if you notice, this person's, you know, again, their head is not in optimal alignment, their shoulders are not in optimal alignment, so there's a lot going on there that we're seeing just from the front, but we'll see it more from the lateral side, all right? Lateral, can't get into full depth, you know, they, they can't get the full, they can't get the hips down and that affects that whole upper positioning. They might be able to start getting to full depth, but then their lower back starts rounding in the center. And then the other one is going to be, um, their arms falling forward. So although this person in the center has low back arching, their arms are still in alignment. Whereas this person, their arms are falling, even though they might be an optimal, you know, spinal alignment. So we're always paying attention to those impairments at that point. 
So what we want to do is use this chart here. You can, you know, and you can develop your own, but this is the chart that you'd want to do checkpoints for so that you can see what the common conditions are. What's overactive, what's underactive, and then we can go from there. All right, because those muscle imbalances will dictate a lot of information and, and it'll make us, it will actually not a lot of information, it'll dictate how we go about correcting them and what we want to do in terms of their, their exercises. So the charts here will help us greatly in terms of understanding if you have turnout, what's overactive, what's underactive. So we want to pay attention to those. As you're going through and studying, again, pause this if you have your book, go through the book chart because this is table 12.5, okay, in your book. And look at these overactive, underactives, all right? Um, valgus or knees caving in, your overactive or your TFL, your tensor fascia lata, and your adductor complex. Those are forcing the knees to come in. Where underactive, your glutes and your anterior and posterior tibialis are not allowing that knee to stay outward, okay? So these are just, you know, again, going through, um, for the lateral positioning, there's your overactives and your underactives, you know, hip flexors, lumbar extensors. What you're going to notice is that a lot of these like positioning, like low back arching, you're going to see a lot of over and underactive positions that are very similar to what we saw statically if somebody had that lower cross syndrome. Okay. And then, you know, going to that lateral view still, there's the, you know, more upper excessive forward trunk. And then arms falling forward, your overs and your unders. There might be some carryover between them, you know, depending upon what position they're pulling them through. So again, pause this, mark them down, look at your book, study them so that you know for a test where what your under and over actives are. So, you know, once we go through and determine our solutions and how we can kind of, you know, one, you know, again, these are if we know our overactives and we know our underactives, again, we, we stretch our overactives and we strengthen our underactives. Okay, that's the key point here. So what we do is if we take care, so if we stretch and pay attention more to our hip flexors, our calves, and then you know just be aware of our rectus abdominis and our external obliques, then we know that you know it's tough to stretch your abs, but you still can. But stretching those will help alleviate that tension that's causing you to pull forward. Whereas when you start doing strengthening exercises in a corrective format to these three, lumbar extensors, hamstrings, and the glute max, you can start pulling that person back into a strengthened positive position. So that's just one example of how we can use these solution charts to do that. So we move from the overhead to the single leg squat. Now the single leg squat is not for everybody, <clears throat> but if a person has scored well on the overhead squat, or you know, the overhead squat assessment, then we can move them into this. But again, if a person lacks balance, we might not wanna throw this at them. Um, we wanna just make sure that we put these people in the prime location and the prime positioning so they can do it correctly. So if they have a hard time with balance or if they have a hard time getting into that single leg squat position in general, then we would avoid this and move on, which is the single leg squat, it's not optional, but it can be. It's one of those ones where we'd rather do the overhead squat as the priority versus the single leg squat. Okay. Um, so the single leg squat, there's your, st your starting position. All right. Looking at squatting down in a single leg position. So this is why balance is really important. Hands on the hips, stable surface, Again, making sure that the other leg is not any more than six inches off the ground. You don't have to be too far. Like you don't have to lift your leg too high. It can be just about six inches off the ground and that's gonna then get your squat as deep as possible. Now you will see a slight bend you know, or a slight angle change, but we're more looking about the knee and the lower ankle because that's gonna dictate the, the, the bad positioning per se. All right, again, five repetitions, then you switch sides, see if there's any difference between them. Same thing as before, shoes off is optimal, okay? If, if they can't, then so be it. So there's the deviation that we were explaining. The knees and the ankle are getting a little aggressive on this one here. So that's gonna be the common impairment, impairment here, which we would call, again, knees flaring in, would be knee valgus. 
So, you know, there's your, you know, that's the check. There's only one major, really major checkpoint for this, and that is from the anterior position, and it's the knees bowing in, which is knee valgus. Is it one or the other, or is it both? Okay, because we want to make sure we know what, and then at that point, what we were to do is find our solutions chart, find out what's over or under active, and then we could go from there and make the right adjustments as needed. So again, make sure you know your overs and unders. You know, if from the anterior view, you're, the reason why the knees are caving in, tight, you know, tight TFLs, tight adductors, and then you also have you know, weak glute maximedius and weak anterior and posterior tibialis muscles. So, you know, one view only for that. So that one, again, it, it's, it's, it's a little tricky to observe, but it's worth observing if the person can handle it. So then we move to our pushing assessment, which is more like a standing chest press with a, with a little bit of a staggered stance, okay? So again, this one is making sure that we see not only scapular, you know, shoulder blade and total shoulder mechanics, but we're also looking at the stability of our, our hips, we're looking at the stability of our cervical spine and then our, also our head for that positioning as well. All right. So again, moving through, making sure that there are, the, all reps are taken care of because you're gonna do, again, more than one rep if needed. So there's their starting position, all right? Now, the person's positioning with the, you know, their hands is just, it's, you really wanna think about it being about chest chest level. So this person might be a little bit higher, but they could come down just a little bit if they needed to, but this is an optimal position for starting. They are going to complete the staggered stance positioning for 10 reps. Now the weight does not have to be challenging. It could be just below challenging, but we're, we're looking to see that even if the weight is lighter, they're still going to, if there's any compensations that they have during these lifts, you're going to see them even at a light to moderate light weight. Okay. So as they push through, all right, again, this person has a nice, nice posture. We're, we're looking at um, where the handles are going. Are they going straight? Are they going up, down, et cetera? Making sure they're going slow. And again, five reps, then five reps. So again, if you go back, you see 10 reps, but it's 10 reps total. Five on the right or five on the right foot forward and then five on the left leg forward because that may change up how they, their, their uh, imbalances show. So what we're looking for is a, you know, a few different things because it's not the same as the overhead squat or the single leg squat because this is more upper body based. We're, we are looking for that rounding back, which we saw earlier. We are looking for shoulder, a shoulder elevation. Now shoulder elevation, kind of like you know, as they push out, they shrug their shoulders. That is actually quite common and some people might actually do that because they thought that that was the right way that this exercise should be you know, completed. And so over years of time, even if they are an active exerciser, we want them to understand that we can't have the elevated shoulders. That's not the purpose of this. We wanna, if we elevate the shoulders, we take off that, that isolation of the chest, okay? And then the other part is if the head juts forward. Okay, so those are three indicators Pushing assessment, nothing from the front, everything from the lateral. And the same thing's gonna carry over to the pulling as well. So there's your, your checkpoints, okay? Looking for those impairments. Do we have them or not? From there, we would say, okay, what can we do? There's our overactives for our low back arch, okay? Hip flexors, lumbar extensors. Then the underactives, glute, me glute maximus, hamstrings, and the abs. So again, again, this carryover from, you know, the, the overhead and the single leg squat, you know, from some of the things you might see with them. There is your, again, your lateral view for both the elevation of the scapula and the head, head forward or head jutting forward positioning. So again, pay attention to those overactive, underactives. Know them because you may see them come up on your test. Pulling, opposing nature, same idea, okay? Same idea, same positioning, just instead of pushing the weight forward, we're gonna be pulling it back. The same premise, 10 reps. You can go a little bit. Um, for this one here, we want that wide split stance, but again, it could be narrowed up if they have a little bit of a, a, little bit of a balance issue, all right?
and then just pulling forward just like we would, 10 reps, slow and controlled, five on the right leg forward, five on the left leg forward, or vice versa. And then we're looking for the same impairments, lower back arching, scap elevating, and forward jutting head. Similar with the, you know, the observations on your, on your chart or one you might create, yes or no. And then same thing, we're looking at where, you know, they're probably going to be more than likely the same over and under actives for each one, right? So, but again, just pay attention to your overactives and underactives and see where the mechanisms are for that. And then we know, again, what to correct, what to stretch, and also what to strengthen. All right. So moving from those, again, are, are they're, they're still static positioning. Even though there's a dynamic movement, there's still, we're not going in motion. We're staying static, but doing a, a movement. So now we're going to get into the performance assessments, which have a lot more of that dynamic appeal. Um, they are, a lot of them are a lot of common, um, you know, motions that a lot of us have done in our lifetime. All right. So looking at the right side there, the push-up tests, the bench press, the squat assessment, vertical jumping, long or broad jumping, the left test, which is what we call the lower extremity functional test the 40 yard dash and our pro shuttle. All right, we'll go through each one of those. So your push-up tests, very common around a lot of testing facilities, uh, very common for, you know, the army, very, you know, or, or any, you know, service um, for police, firefighting, they all work around push-up testing, even children in the PE classes, okay? So there's your positioning, all right, working on um, that solid push-up position, Hands, you know, should be slightly outside of the shoulders. Um, they should be stacked, you know, on top of each other. Um, elbows and knees fully extended that are neutral. And then you're going to work on moving that down and up. The client lowers their body to achieve 90 degrees of elbow flexion. All right. And then it says you're going to do it for 60 seconds. The main purpose here, assessing for upper body muscular endurance. Okay. And then like it says here, when's a good time to reassess? Four to six weeks. You know, reevaluate your, to reevaluate your program and see how it goes. The bench press, all right, bench pressing. We know about bench pressing and how it's, it's basically the inverse of the push-up. We're just going to be lying down versus, you know, on our hands, all right? So we're going to be lying down. This one here is going to be more about a one repetition max. So we're going to be assessing maximal strength this one again this is another one that we want to think about do is this really appropriate for our clientele it, it really can be appropriate for everybody but understand that in this case do we really need to do it for a particular person or could we do it for reps and and find you know so there's a lot of factors that come into play with this and what we want to use it for okay but make sure that we also know that a spotter is going to be required so Take a look at the positioning for your starting and then we'll move from there. So, you know, again, you, you can have assistance of unracking the bar, okay? And that's, that's appropriate. But then once you, you, you count it off together, three, two, one, one, two, three, however you want to do it and however they want to hand it off. And then from there, they're going to handle that weight and then they'll re-rack it, all right? Take their warm-up sets accordingly. Take at least two minutes of rest. Don't be afraid to go three to five minutes of rest as you um, move into the heavier weights, especially with a more active person. And then from there, you can make five to 10% jumps if needed. Or as you start getting heavier, it might be less than five to 10% jumps. But understand that you're really looking at, you know, really, um, you're looking at three attempts that we're looking for there, okay? So very, very important for that. Definitely looking at trying to, you know, again, looking for that maximal strength. Squat strength is the same premise as the bench press. Same thing, except now we're getting into the proper positioning of, you know, where should that person be in, in, in terms of where's their line of pull, you know, and on their muscles, are they engaged the correct way in terms of, you know, where is it that they're going through, you know, through the range of motion and are they hitting that depth that we need to? Because we want to think that in terms of depth, 
we really want to think about how, um, again, femurs parallel, um, female, fe female, femurs parallel or lower, okay? F 90 degrees of hip is optimal for most people, but if some people can go lower than that, that is, you know, and it's, uh, and they're maintaining their posture, I am not opposed to them going lower, especially if they are doing it for specific reasonings, okay? So that's really critical for that. Now, when we look at, you know, uh, the squat itself, we really want to think about how the barbell sits, depending upon what kind, really the barbell wants to sit on those upper traps. We want to think about bringing the elbows back slightly to create that little shelf for the barbell, okay? And then from there, we want to think, release the hips and the knees almost simultaneously, but it's never the knees first, okay? more of an upright chest, not, you don't want to have an exaggerated lean forward. All right. So we want to be always neutral with low back. Okay. Trying to maintain optimal foot positioning that will translate into optimal knee positioning. And that will really make it so that we go to the right motion. So again, you can help a person come off the rack, but really it's safer for them to do it themselves. All right. Go ahead and do your assessment, you know, do your reps and then Go ahead and take your rest as needed. And then you can add load as needed. They say 10 to 20% of the initial load. All right. And then go from there to add accordingly. Because again, it may not be in 10 to 20% increments as you start getting super heavy. Three attempts, you know, to try to get the maximum amount of weight you can. All right. And then from there, you can go into, like it says there, you can go into what they call the appendix A and calculate that person's one rep max if you were to do a three rep assessment. But if you have a person trying to achieve a one rep max, whatever they get is their max strength. So vertical jump using what we, this is actually a Vertec device, all right? It's with the little, um, little uh, bars here that you're trying to hit. So again, that person is going to set up underneath. What you will do is you will set up that person to their standing height. Okay, so what you do is you have them stand tall, you have them extend one arm up in the air without overextending and not lifting. All right, and then from there, what you do is you would drop the vertex down to the bottom bar would touch their top of their finger. At that point, they would have to jump up as, you know, squat down, jump up as high as they can and swat their hand to hit those bars at the highest level. Now, if a person it's say you're working with an athlete who ha you know has a very high vertical jump or you're working with like a power lifter or an Olympic weightlifter and we know that they're going to be able to go because go above 24 inches because that's the max that you can get on those bars. Then we can adjust this standing height here by adding things like from where their standing height is, adding 12 inches to that because this little pole here that comes up and down that you adjust actually has indicator lines of inches that you can do. Okay. So that's where we want to be able to take us through go and pressing forward with that. Okay. And then they squat down slightly and then jump up as hard as they can and explode up off the ground. And then, like I said, squat, squatting, pressing through and swiping their arms to get the highest height reach that they can. The long jump, on the other hand, is going out versus up. Same premise, explosiveness, horizontal. This is horizontal power where the vertical jump is vertical power. Okay. Very big on performance indicators. So for same thing here, like it says, they want to use a tape measure. And what you want to do is be able to, you know, have your line marked where you're going to jump from. That person starts behind the line, gets it to that slightly squatted position. It's a two, it's a two foot jump and a two foot land. So however far they need to squat down, you don't want to, you know, you want to be explosive. So you don't want to do a full squat and then jump out. You want to think about bending down again, optimal positioning with the hips hinging and the knees bending slightly and exploding off of the, you know, they say the heels of the foot, but really the whole foot to be able to explode out and up or more out than up though, but you want to still be off the ground. All right. From there, three attempts, just like you would with the, with the vertical jump and you, the score would be the highest one you would get and then assess as needed. Okay. 
So jumping out and then that tape measure from wherever they land, all right, wherever they land. Now, if they land on two feet and then they fall a little bit forward, it still goes by where the, the heel landed first. So sometimes this is really good to do in like a sand pit if you have one because you can see where the feet land. Other times you might have to say, okay, you're going to have to redo that one because you have to be able to land and then be able to stand up from where you are to get the right distance traveled. The lower extremity test or lower extremity functional test or the left test is where we would have two cones set up about 10 yards apart, okay? So about 30 feet. And what you're gonna do with them is you're gonna have them go in multiple directions. So if you look A through G, those you ha they have to do it in that manner. So starting at cone one, so if we're over here on the right side, we wanna think about starting here, we're gonna sprint forward. We're gonna back pedal back. We're gonna side shuffle one way, side shuffle back, okay? So now we're coming, now from there, karaoke. Now karaoke's or karaoke's, um, those are where the forward foot crosses over the back foot and then behind, forward and behind, all right? And then lastly, you would finish off with a sprint and then that would complete your time for how long it took you to do the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different positionings throughout that whole time. So really, if you think about it, that's 210 yards total coverage, or excuse me, 70 yards, 210 feet covered over the course of a very short period of time. So again, this, is, this can be for many different people, but again, think about who the right clientele and the right demographic this would be for. 40 yard dash assessment, again, who is this for? Because we wanna think about, you know, what is the whole purpose of this? It's acceleration, it's reaction, and it's actually maximal sprint speed. How fast you go from the start point to 40 yards, okay? So once, once that, and basically how it works is, as soon as that person makes their first movement, you start the stopwatch, and as soon as they cross the line, you end the stopwatch, and it's their fastest time of, of how many particular trials you want to. Typically, you know, the first one is always the best, but a person might just be getting warmed up, so you can have them do like a couple of 40 meter, you know, 40, 40 yard dash runs as quick as, you know, as not as quick as possible, just to kind of ease into the flow. And then they'll say, okay, now you have one attempt to get it done as fast as you can. So it just is up to you on how you want to achieve that. But again, it's the fastest sprint speed of that 40 yard distance. The pro shuttle is going to, that's, this is a combination of many different things, acceleration, deceleration, agility, and then control. And what it is, you're going to have three cones though. You're going to have three cones that are set up 10, the middle cone is the middle. So the two end cones are 10 yards apart. The middle cone is five is halfway. So five yards in the middle. And then from there, what you would do is if you follow the arrows, starting in the middle cone, you're going to sprint to the right as fast as possible. Tap that cone. Sprint all the way to the left cone, tap that cone, and then you will run through and run through the middle cone. And so from the first movement, tap the first cone, tap the far cone, run through the middle cone, and whenever time you're, you run through that middle cone is your final time. So you're going to go 5 yards, 10 yards, 5 yards. That's why it's called the 5-10-5 or pro shuttle drill. So very quick, very explosive. There's a lot of speed up, slow down, and, it, and that really is one of the things that is going to make this time faster or slower and very dependent upon that is whether you are, you know, you can slow down, speed up as fast as you can. All right. So again, regular, regular testing on this to be able to get us to show what we're really, you know, whether we're making improvements, especially if this is a really important one for athletes in particular, but again, you can always work with any other, you know, client that you want to performance based ones again, can be worked with whoever you want to, because again, it's your assessment for your general fitness for weight loss goals, whatever. Um, but again, if you're doing it for weight loss, this probably isn't a test that you want to do. If you're doing, but you know, for general fitness, probably not the test you want to do, but if you want to, you know, a person wanted to, show that their performance is going up just for themselves, then go for it. But if it's, you know, weight loss isn't really going to affect this here because it's more performance based. So that's the end of our performance based testing. So what we want to make sure of again is what is the order 
of our sequence here. And really the main thing is this bottom chart. We want to do our paperwork first, our, pre, our pre-participation screenings. We then want to do our physiological assessments. We talked about those. That is your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your, you know, your heart rate and your, your blood pressure are the main things. You can do things like breathing rate and things like that. From there, you'll go to your body comp, okay, your BMI and body comp. You can then go into your posture and movement assessments, into your cardio assessments, and then your performance assessments. This should be the transition points on how you want to do it if you're going to do it all in one day, okay? But remember this sequence, it's fairly important because it's going to be put onto your test for sure. They want to know the sequencing of that, okay? That's how we get people in. That's how we sequence our assessments. That's how we get appropriate non-skewed results. So again, be very aware of your clientele. We talk, I said this a lot throughout, but overweight and obese considerations and modifications, all right? Make sure that their pre-participation screening is complete. You know, don't assume that just because they're, and this is no disrespect to anybody, but ju- just because your person is larger, overweight or obese, does not mean that they don't have any ability. And that's really a bad assumption to make because people are going to be surprised when it's like, I didn't realize they could do that, but that's such a horrible thing to have to say because you went in with preconceived notions. So don't do that. Okay. It's very important not to do that. And then really the main thing here, like I said, is consider limiting movements that require someone to get up and down. So if you're going to do something like a push-up test, you don't want to keep following that up with an up and then a down because it's hard for them to maneuver. Okay. So how do we modify? Change up the depth of their overhead squat assessment. Don't do the single leg squat assessment. Okay. That's going to you know really hurt that. But if they show proper strength, then let them try it. All right. Have them do a pushing or pulling assessment in a uh, two-foot stance versus a staggered stance. Okay, have them just stand so that, or, or for whatever is more comfortable for them. But again, don't assume. Make sure that you know what they can do. With youth, on the other hand, you know, youth can do a lot of things that we sometimes, do, you know, they're not little adults, but at the same time, they're also plenty capable of doing a lot of things. Just be aware that trying to give them like a one rep max assessment may not be appropriate. So we might want to think about considering that. All right. But, you know, again, that single leg squat, if they're very iffy on their balance and coordination, we might not want to present that to them. All right. So how do we modify? Do your, instead of max strength, do muscular endurance, do more reps than we would for versus a one rep max test. Okay. Um, the other thing about it too is don't be afraid to to do the push-up test, the left test, the pro shuttle, the vertical jump because they're fun. Okay, children like them and they actually will, you know, if you make it more entertaining for them, they may achieve better results versus making it like burdening for them. Older adults, again, know your people. All right. So, but again, don't don't let just because they're older doesn't don't let their ability cloud your judgment or, or your uh, your judgment cloud what their ability level really is all right so we just want to make sure that again up and down off the ground based on their ability that's another one but just be aware and then also pre-participation screenings are going to be optimal because we don't know what they're coming in with in condition wise because sometimes you may not you can't see osteoporosis you can't see um, arthritis. So we just have to be aware to get that as much information as possible. So again, overhead squat depth, like the overweight and obese is going to be optimal. Try to figure out if their single leg squat is necessary. And then again, more comfortability for um, pushing and pulling assessments. Now, prenatal, we're talking about pregnant women. Be Again, be very aware of what you're getting yourself into with this. Again, Movement patterns are going to be very different for them because they're now ha- they have a belly. So that's going to be a little bit different for them. That's the modification that you're going to be aware of. So again, don't take their that they can't do something just because they're pregnant, but understand that, you know, we want to make it more comfortable for them more so than anything else. With the assessments up and down off the ground is not going to be the best choice. So we're going to avoid doing a lot of that. And then again, depending upon how far along they are, This might be something where it's, you know, if they're in the second and third trimester, we're not going 
prone or supine. We're not going prone on the back, supine on the belly to compromise their pregnancy. So again, overhead squat, check the depth. They might not be able to achieve it, especially if they're later on in their pregnancy. I would, you know, they also do, but I would recommend it from you know, professional experience. Don't do the single leg squat because their center of gravity and center of mass is different. And then again, pushing and pulling is going to be based on what their comfort level is. Okay. So again, all these assessments are going to just keep getting, you know, your people um, better and they're going to, you know, as they go through their programming and it just, the next time you do it, when they start seeing the results, it makes them happier and wants them to, you know, then they want to stay and they want to keep getting better. So the more options you give people, the better it is in terms of, yeah, the scores may not be great initially, but the more you work with them and they start seeing, wow, I'm doing very well. And that's why, you know, always looking at the scale is not the most important thing. It's like, huh, I, I you know, in, in two months, just say eight weeks, you, you went up 10, 10 reps on your push-up assessment. That's a big achievement. So, you know, again, reassess, 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 so you can give new, new, new and make things less stale. Okay. So again, our assessments are meant for getting info, whether it's generic information or performance information, all of this builds that, you know, takes all those puzzle pieces and puts them into one beautiful picture. And then from there we can stay, you know, start thinking about that next step, which is going to be, what are the phases that we want to pay attention to for our, our exercise? And how can we make the best exercise plan possible? So everything moving forward from here is going to be the sections of the actual workout plan that we want to focus in on. All right. So our chapter 13 will start with the we're talking about integrated training and then we'll go from there. So again, thank you. And let's continue to move on to our next one.